Colossians chapter number 1, begin reading in verse number 16 this morning. The Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, yeah, and he is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. I'll stop reading there. If you haven't picked up on it, these verses, the Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus. And so in verse number 16, when it says, For by him were all things created, that means Jesus was there when everything was made. When it says, things that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, what's he talking about? It don't matter where you go. It don't matter how high you look or how low you dig. It doesn't matter how deep or how wide. You can get whatever you find, Jesus made it. And it says, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. He says, we're not just talking about things that you can see with your eye. Everything that has been created, whether it's a kingdom, whether it's a king, does not the Bible teach us that no one rises to power or nobody is taken off a throne unless God ordains it? Right? All things are created by him. There's no thing on earth, there's no person since Adam and Eve took their first breath that has ever been able to say that they made something of themselves. No. All power, all dominion, all thrones. In other words, what well, verse number 16 says, it don't matter how you phrase it, Jesus made it. Do you want to know why the United States is, you know, on the face of the earth today? Because Jesus made it. You want to know why Joe Biden's in the White House, whether you like it or not? Because the Lord ordained it. You want to know why the Emmanuel Baptist Church exists today? Because Jesus made it. You want to know why you have the life that you have? Because that's the way that God has worked it out in your life. All things were not just created by Him. We go, verse number 17, and He is before all things. What's that mean? That means He's first and foremost. You can't get in front of Jesus. You can't get higher than Jesus. You can't get more glorious than Jesus. Can't get more powerful. Can't get more, um, you know, omniscient. Can't know more than Jesus knows. Why? He is first and foremost. Okay, it says, before all things, and by Him all things consist. Not only is He first, everything else exists because He was first. If Jesus was involved with the creation of all things, but Jesus wasn't, the first thing, what's that? That's called God. That's why he said I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. If Jesus wasn't a part of God, but Jesus made everything else, right? just think about this for a second. If anything were to become stronger than Jesus, it'd be able to undo everything that he made. If death really was stronger than Christ, when he died on the cross, everything would have stopped existing. If Satan was more powerful than Jesus, right, it wouldn't be like the world or modern day theology would teach you that there's a chess mask going on and that God's going to eke out, you know, the, the final win. No, if the devil had more power than Jesus, everything just stopped existing. Right? If there was one second of one day that God didn't have absolute all power, right, it wouldn't just be like, oh, the sun would stop moving in the sky. No, no, no. All things consist. doesn't say exist. Through Him all things consist. You know what that means? They exist because He exists. They don't exist because He made them. They exist because He had the power to make it and the power to keep it. But we don't have time to get into all the details. Go get you a microscope. Put something underneath of it. And then zoom in as far as you can and keep focusing and zooming and focusing and zooming. You know what you're going to find? There's a whole lot more going on 
deep down, once you start paying attention, then you really know about. But you know what? Didn't catch God by surprise. It consists through Him. Every blood cell in your body carries oxygen because God said that that's what it's supposed to do, and God keeps it that way. So if anything were to have more of a preeminence, right? if He was not foremost, if he was not altogether lovely, if he was not all-powerful, if he was not all-love, if he wasn't God, then nothing else would exist. Not only would he not been able to create it, he wouldn't have been able to keep it created. Well, verse number 18. And he is the head of the body of the church. Why do you think Jesus is in charge of the church? Because he's in charge of everything. Whether you admit it or not, he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's in charge of everything that's going on, and all the planets spinning around, all them asteroids that NASA's worried about hitting the earth, not going to hit the earth. Well, how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because I know how the earth ends and there ain't a big rock coming out of the sky. Well, there's this chance that in 40 billion years, not going to happen. I think we need to. I heard about one the other day. They want to go up and they want to paint one side of this huge asteroid white and then the other side black because believe it or not because of solar radiation and stuff that will actually cause it to change path and to miss the earth because there's like a point zero 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 one percent chance that it could hit earth not going to happen it's foolishness why because God said that that's not how the earth going to end right, but anyway says that he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning now I want you to notice there between church and who there's this thing called a colon okay, you use colon when you're getting ready to use examples of what you just talked about okay, for instance I wrote an email the other day that said blah 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 please see the items below colon and then there was a list right so when it comes to your Bible in verse number 18, he is the head of the body of the church. Okay, we're still talking about Jesus. He's the head of the church. Well, why is he the head of the church? Well, Paul's getting ready to tell you here. Who is the beginning? Well, why is he the head of the body, which he called the body of Christ, the church? Okay, why is he in charge of it? Well, first off, he is the beginning. Didn't say who was from the beginning. No, no, no. Who is the beginning? I don't know because the Bible don't tell us about this thing called the Alpha of Time. But before God one day stepped out on nothing and said, let there be light. Long before that, God existed. Well, where did he exist from? The beginning. Well, how'd that happen? I don't know. God didn't explain it. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. But ever since there has been, God has been. Not a moment, not a iota of time has existed that God didn't exist with it. It's not that he's been there from the beginning. No, he is the beginning. Right? So why is he in charge of the church? Because he's been in charge of everything since the beginning. Says the firstborn from the dead. Anybody ever lay down their life and take it back up again besides Jesus? The answer to that is no. There have been some that have had their life taken up by Christ. Lazarus come forth. He touched that boy on the funeral pyre. He got up off of it. Right? There have been some that were raised from the dead, but guess what? They died again. They had to go back to the grave. For a moment, for a space of time, Christ allowed them to enter the grave so that he could prove that he was stronger than the grave. So that people would believe when he said that, you know, you could tear down the temple but in three days he'd raise it up again build it again he was talking about the temple of the flesh that they could put him in the grave but he wasn't going to stay there right? it's not that he's just from the beginning it's not that he's had all power that he created everything that through him all things consist it's not just that things in this life are controlled by him, things in the next life too there's a contradiction to the world, right? Bible correctors will tell you that, verse number 18, that there cannot be anything that's firstborn 
of something that's dead. That just don't make sense, Brother Jordan. Right? There can't be a firstborn of the dead. Dead things don't give life. That's right. Because Christ was never dead. He laid down this mortal flesh. He gave up the ghost after the fashion of a sacrifice, but he was. We just read it. Right? He's the head of the body. Who is the beginning? Right? He laid down his life, but the devil couldn't take it from him. Why? Because he is life. He took it off and he laid it down for a moment. But there wasn't nobody that could touch it. Because it was his. He had the power to lay it down and to take it up. Do you understand that the devil did everything in his power starting from about, oh, well, I'm sure he was at it long before then, but that we have evidence of in the Bible. First off, he temp tempted Christ right after he had fasted for 40 days because the devil don't like fighting fair. Right, but he shows up and what did the Lord do? He just rebuked him with the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is the words of the one that is God and what's he? He's from the beginning. The devil can't argue with something that's been around longer than him. God made Lucifer. How do you argue with someone that says, hey, you remember when I made you? Right? That's why you can't win an argument with parents because they got the trump card. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of it. But really, how do you look at the one that you know made everything, that you used to sing songs about in glory, that was his job as the, the angel of music, right? how do you look at him and say you're wrong, knowing that he was the one that made you? So when Jesus said, I'm going to lay down my life, the devil tried everything he could to take it. Couldn't move it. Couldn't touch it. Couldn't cause it to do anything but stay right where Jesus left it. And then guess what Jesus did? He came by and he picked it back up again. Came walking out of that tomb. But see, the devil tried everything he could. Look at the Garden of Gethsemane. He tried to get the body of Christ to fail. He gave up on trying to kill him. He said, we're just going to cripple his flesh to where he can't make it to the cross. His body was hemorrhaging. You know what that means? It literally was pulling itself apart. It was under such strain... That, you know, that's why they say, go get your tetanus shots. Tetanus is a horrible thing. Tetanus causes the muscles in your body to constrict and to not let go. Back in ye olden days, if you got tetanus, there wasn't anything they could do for it. And you knew that slowly your muscles were going to start getting tighter and tighter. Your muscles are so strong that if they lock up long enough, and if they cramp badly enough to where you can't unclench them, that you will break bones. Because your muscles are stronger than your bones if they apply a strong enough force. People have broken backs because their back muscles so tight and they can't loosen them up. That's why tetanus is such a horrible disease. Hallelujah, they got a vaccine for it. What happens when you step on a rusty nail? You go get a tetanus shot, you don't have to go through that. But those muscles literally are tearing that person apart. But what do you think Christ was going through in the Garden of Gethsemane? His body was under such a strain that it was ripping itself apart. He was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. There was so much trauma on the inside that he wasn't bleeding from a cut or bleeding from a wound. No, he was just bleeding and the blood was trying to get out. That's the amount of strain that the devil was trying to put his body under. He knew he couldn't kill him. He, he is life. He was trying to cripple him to keep him from getting to the cross. That devil knows flesh. What's flesh? It's the stuff that you know he tempted in order to disobey God. Tempted in order to sin. He beguiled the woman. The woman gave unto Adam and he did eat. That he knew exactly what fruit it was, he still ate it anyway. That the devil knows flesh. He knows he's stronger than flesh. There ain't anybody in this room can walk up to the devil, decide to pick a fight, and then win. Now he's bigger and he's stronger than you. The Bible did call him a roaring lion. I don't know about you, but I'm not walking into a fight with a lion and winning. 
Right, if it's hanging to hand, claw to claw, not going to happen. Right, well, Satan thought, well, I know what flesh is like. I'm stronger than flesh. Yeah, but he wasn't stronger than that flesh. Because inside of that flesh was robed all the righteousness of God. He tried to kill him. He couldn't do it. Why? Because he's from the beginning. He had all power. By him and through it, that flesh couldn't have existed. Satan can't exist if God isn't God. Because through him do all things consist. Right, well, don't know how we got off on most of that, but it was the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. Keep in mind, verse number 18 is talking about Jesus being the head of the body. The body being the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know why Christ laid down his life and took it back up again? So that everybody that got saved had to admit that Jesus did it first. Now, I don't know about you. This may just be me. But I know some church folk think that they walk on gold they don't do nothing wrong that if they don't show up church can't happen right if they don't give their tithe check then the church is going under no church is going to keep going on as long as God says it's supposed to go on right if you don't show up maybe it might be a better service if you came in with a bad spirit you know why Christ laid down his life became the firstborn of the dead so that everyone that received a second birth after him had to admit that it was him. It's real hard to start, you know. This is why I, I get in trouble every now and then. People start saying, well, this, that, I didn't. They start strutting like a peacock. I just, I'll usually find a way to bring up. A, but hey, isn't that because, you know, God empowered the church to do this, that, or the other? Well, yeah, what are, you, what are you talking about? I'm saying you didn't do nothing. God did it. Right? When was the last time you went up and shook the hand of the hammer that built the house you live in? Right? Who do you shake? You thank the guy called a construction worker. You thank the builder, the planner. You thank the people that built it. You don't walk up and, you know, thank the toolbox. Why was Christ firstborn from that? So that everything that came after him gave him the preeminence the first place the best seat gave it in their heart the place of preeminence gave in their mind the place of preeminence gave in their soul the place of preeminence why? because so that we'd be able to fulfill thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul with all thy mind Christ is preeminent so that you will remember He's preeminent. He did everything for us, not for His sake. He was already from the beginning. By Him, through Him, did all things consist. But it's not about what He did for Himself, because He had all things. He made it all for Himself. So verse number 16 says, all things were created by Him and for Him. So why did He come, lay down His life, become firstborn of the dead? For you. But He did it first so that you would always be looking at Him. Not at yourself. Arm of flesh is going to fail you. If a man thinks he's staying, let him take heed lest he fall. By the haughty spirit goes before destruction. Pride before fall. No, I flipped that. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. If everything that you had was based off of what you did, you'd be in bad shape. You know why Christ is the head of the church? Because He's the only one that could be the head of the church. You want an, exa you want an example why Christ being the head of the church is a good example? Go read the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts. You're going to find that there was 11 apostles. And they knew that God promised that there'd be 12 apostles. So they said, well, boys, we need to get this sorted out. We don't want us to limit what God's going to do. We know God said there's going to be 12 apostles. Let's go find the 12th one. 
So they started looking. Go read it. They found one. They actually found a couple that had been with them from the beginning. That means that they saw everything that the other 11 apostles had seen. They had been everywhere that the other apostles had been. They saw Jesus after he got up out of the grave, which was the requirement of being an apostle. Had to see him before and after. Why? So that you could testify that he was, then he died, and then he was again. But, through all of that, they got themselves down to two. And they said, well, boys, go be honest. Either one of y'all make a fine apostle. You upright. You believe right. You live right. You've been just as involved as we have from the beginning. They said, so we don't know which one we're going to pick. So, Lord, you pick. And then, now, this is just me again. If you ask God to pick, wouldn't you wait for God to answer? That's just, that's my opinion. If you ask God, wouldn't you wait for God to answer? What'd they do? They said, Lord, you pick, and then they cast lots. In other words, they rolled the dice. That's not letting God pick. That's you picking. Right? Well, what happened to that guy? Well, they called him an apostle, but then you don't see nothing no more. What do you say? God has preeminence. He's the head of the church. What happened? Eleven apostles tried to be the head of the church. They made a mess of it. Because you know who God had as the twelfth apostle? The apostle Paul, the one who wrote this book of your Bible. The other eleven would have thrown him out on the road, you know, the street. Half of them didn't believe, you know, half the same folk didn't believe him anyway when he said he got saved. Which, healthy skepticism, you know, good thing sometimes. They're like, aren't you Paul, the one that's been killing all of us? He's like, no, nah, my name's Saul now. Or no, aren't you Saul, the one that... He said, no, nah, my name's Paul now. He's like, I brought one of the brothers from Damascus. He's here to testify on my behalf that I really did get saved. And they're like, hmm, okay. You go back to Damascus. We don't want you around here. Now, we don't know if you're real or not. That's why God's the head of the church, because you'd make a mess of it. We're talking about the apostles. The ones that God used to turn this world upside down. Yet they still made a mess of it. God winked at their ignorance anyway. You want to know why man's not in charge of the church? Because man messed it up. Well, verse number 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You know what in these couple of verses we've learned? about Jesus Jesus came before everything because he was at the beginning that means that not just is he being part of God the oldest thing around God's the only thing around you know why everything exists because of God you know what that means God's the only thing around you know why that pew doesn't fall and hit the ground right now because God said so it's not because it's got a base and it's got screws in it. I find that Jesus walked into a room that had all the windows and the doors locked. How'd he do that? He's God. You know why that pew doesn't fall and hit the ground? Because God said it's not supposed to. You know why gravity exists? Because God said so. You know why waves have tides and they get bigger and then you know they swell and then they lower again? Because God said so. Really, it's because of the moon, but you know who put the moon there in order for it to cause the waters to do that? God. We can go as far down the rabbit hole as you want. You know what the answer is? God. Well, we've learned that about Christ. So everything exists because of Him, but it exists through Him. Meaning that without Him, everything stop existing. It's one thing to say, well, I made that Lego tower over there. But if I go away, forget about the Lego tower, as long as that Lego tower was, you know, stuck together when I left, it should be stuck together when I come back. I'm not the one holding that Lego tower together. Right now, if all the blocks were, you know, Velcroed together, what's holding it together? The Velcro, not me. We can super glue things together. What's holding it together? The super glue. I may put it there, but I'm not the one holding it there. 
See, God's the one that not only made it, God's the one that keeps it from falling apart. But what else have we learned about Christ? That He's got preeminence in all things. It don't matter where you go. You may think that you've seen the be most beautiful sunset that you've ever seen. You know what's not as beautiful as Jesus? Because He's got the preeminence. You may go and find and you know, find the person that you think is the smartest as ever been. Not as smart as Jesus. You want chapter and verse on that? Go read the accounts of when he went to the temple at 12 years old. He left the, the smartest of the scholars dumbfounded. He's answering questions that you know they'd had amongst themselves for hundreds of years. He's just answering them like it's no big problem. Why? Because he's got the preeminence in all things. He knew it all because he was there when it all happened. It doesn't matter how big your giant is, God's bigger than your giant. It doesn't matter how big your anxiety, your fear, your depression, it doesn't matter what you go through, there's something bigger than it. It's called Jesus. Why? Because he has preeminence in all things. He's bigger, he's greater, he's more powerful, he's been around longer, and he'll be around a whole lot long after. It doesn't matter which way you try to measure it, God's bigger than whatever you're looking at. That's what having the preeminence means. Well, it says, For it pleased the Father that in Him, who? In the Son, as O N, should all fullness dwell. You know why Christ has all preeminence? You know why through Him all things consist? You know why He is the firstborn of the dead? Why He's the head of the church? You know why Christ is set so highly by God the Father? You know why he was given a name that was above every other name? A name that when it was first spoken unto man, it had to be spoken by an angel? You know why one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's King of kings and Lord of lords? You know why that is? Because God purposed, it says, for it pleased the Father. That meant, in other words, God planned it to be so. God allowed it to happen. So God the Father was pleased and designed to happen that in God the Son all fullness shall dwell. But what's that mean? That means that in Christ is all fullness. Well, what's that fullness? What's he talking about? Well, see, all fullness, because Christ is, if you discover it, he's above everything, he's in front of everything, he's greater than everything. By him was all things created and through him all things consist you know what it means when it says all fullness is found in the sun it means that it don't matter what you need don't matter what it is that you're seeking for doesn't matter what you're looking for out in the world you know where you'll find the fullness of it in Jesus now, let, let me give you an example Okay, you can go to Christian. Christian knows a little bit about cooking. He knows a little bit about cooking because he went away to college and he decided that he wanted to eat stuff like Mama used to make and he found out that you can't get stuff that Mama makes down there at Eastern Kentucky University. So he learned how to make Mom's cookies. And he was addicted to bacon. That's why they called him in the police academy hog jaws because he has, you know, jaws like a hog because he eats so much hog right he used to make bowls out of bacon and then put salads inside of them that's real healthy right he, he knows a little bit about cooking I think at one point he had the recipe for mom's cookies right? you can go and ask him for that recipe or I can go to the one that doesn't need a recipe she looks at it, she just throws it in the bowl, and then next thing you know, hey, there's the cookie dough. Well, how long do I put it in there for? I don't need to go check a sheet. She'll tell you. Put it in there this hot for that long. Well, when do I take it out? Take it, you know, take it out. When can I eat it? Don't eat it yet until too soft. I can ask him. There's a good chance it's not going to be the same. It might be close. But I know the one in whom all the greatest cookies, and see, I'm not alone in this. Anybody that's ever had mom's cookies, they agree with me. Everybody thinks I'm crazy until they try one, right? What happened? I know the one that in all fullness of the chocolate chip cookies, I know where it dwells, the Ned Foster. 
Right? It's not with Christian. If I want chocolate chip cookies, I'm going to the source. I'm not going for the duplication. What he's saying, Brother George, well, you can go out there and you can look for wisdom. You know where the fullness of all wisdom is found? In Christ. Why do you think the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? You want to know where all comfort is with the great comforter? Capital C comforter. Who's that? That's God, your Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost that seals and indwells you until the day of redemption. Why is He the comforter? Capital C. Because in Him does all fullness dwell. You feel unloved today? I know the one that is love. In Him does all fullness dwell. It don't matter what you're looking for. God's got the fullness of it. You can go down and you can have a hamburger at Burger King or you can go down to like Jeff Ruby's and have steak. Guess what? One of them's got the fullness of deliciousness in it and the other one's called fast food. Right? It may not be the best burger you've ever had down at Jeff Ruby's, but I guarantee you this, it's a whole lot fuller than the one down there at Burger King. Right? I know where all fullness can be found. It's in Christ. It's been that way since the beginning. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. doesn't say that after Christ came and was born of a virgin, that after He went through everything that He did in His earthly ministry, after He rose from the dead, it didn't say that then in Him should all fullness dwell. No, it's always dwelled there. Why do you think anybody that came to Jesus with a sincere spirit left being full? Because in Him does all fullness dwell. You want to be full? Go to the one who has all the fullness. You understand the reason that God has never desired anything is because God is everything? We already said that through Him all things were made. Right? Everything that was made is an extension of God. Why do you think that it's an insult unto God that man chose to sin because God made man in his image God reached down and fashioned man out of the dust of the earth with his very hand God breathed into man the very breath of God which caused him to become a living soul you know why man exists because God gave part of himself to man you know why trees exist because God said so and God put it there and God keeps it there you want to know why you can't get rid of dandelions? Because God wanted them to exist. You want to know why all the things that you can look at in nature, this is why man's without excuse to look around at everything that's created and know that nothing else that we can see created anything else that we see. We know that there's a divine creator. You know why? Because you can look around and you can see that everything that was made, it serves a purpose. But even though it serves a purpose, I know the one that in all fullness, or that in him all fullness dwells. Right? God did great th this thing called like an aloe vera plant. If you're like me, right, and you're neon white, you're not just white, you're neon white. You get to the point, RC, I'm so white my legs reflect sunlight. Right? I blind people if I wear shorts. Okay? It's dangerous. But if you're like me and you spend time out in sunlight, you're liable to get burned. Right? God made this thing called an aloe vera plant, which somebody, I, I, I don't know how it happened. I'd love to have been there. Ah, oh, man, but I got a bad sunburn. Cut that plant open and stick it to you. That makes zero sense. Right? I understand that. You get the blue stuff or you get the green stuff out of the bottle, you put it on. I don't know how it works. I just know that it works. But if that'll work for your physical ailments, your physical why would you not go to the one that has the balm of Gilead? You know what the balm of Gilead is? It's aloe vera on crack. Whatever you got, it's going to heal. Whatever infection you've got, it's going to stave it off. Whatever threat or danger that there might be with an infection, the balm of Gilead is going to take care of it. It's going to nip it in the bud. Now sure, you can get in here and you can labor and you can go and ask many people. And the Bible says that there's great wisdom 
in a multitude of counsel. The Bible says that if, you know, God blesses you with the church family like we got, where there are those that have been around the block a time or two, that you can go and it, they're supposed to disciple you. You're not supposed to ask them, they're supposed to. Hallelujah, we got a pastor that's got a library bigger than, you know, most small towns throughout Kentucky. But why? Well, so that he can study. So that we can be partakers with... Not, not everybody in here has got enough brain power or enough time to learn everything that there is to know about God. But God gave us an under-shepherd to lead us and guide us, to instruct us, to reprove us, to rebuke us through preaching. But as great a pastor, as great as the church library as we got, as great as some of the elders of the church that we got around here, and as you know, great that they do with what they do, I know the one in whom all fullness dwells. I know the one that can speak to my soul and can speak peace to it. You know why he can do that? Because one day he said, let there and everything was created. And then one day man sinned and then this thing called chaos entered into the world. Right? Division, destruction, death. Because the wages of sin are what? Death. All that happened not because God created, but because God created everything that now is disrupted. You know what that means? He's still got power over it. Why do you think when he is walking out there on the water, he rebuked the went peace, be still. Why do you think the things went peaceful? Because he told it to. He was the one that told it to start flowing in the first place. He was the one that allowed it to whip up into a storm. So if he can speak peace to a storm... What gave him the power to do that? He made it. Well, guess what? He made you. So he can speak unto you peace, and you know that there's going to be peace. In him does all fullness dwell. You want to know why so many Christians are miserable today? They don't have enough Jesus in their life. Because on the authority of your Bible, you're never going to be disappointed in him. In him does all fullness dwell. By saying that if you got enough Jesus in your life, you're always going to be happy, happy, happy? That's all I said. I said so many Christians are miserable. Why? Because they're empty. There's a difference between being full and being happy. You know what full means? You're not looking for anything else. You know why Job didn't second guess for a moment that he was supposed to carry on living as thus saith the Lord? and not doubting God for what he had allowed to happen to him. You know why Job was able to do that? Because long before God filled Job's house, and he filled Job's barns, and he filled Job's storehouses, and he filled Job's bank, Job was filled with God. Job was the richest man in the East. But that didn't have a hold of Job. You know what had a hold of Job? God. You know how I know that? Because every day Job went and offered up sacrifice unto God for him and his children in case they forgot. Go study out what a burnt sacrifice. You had to stay there until the whole offering was consumed by the fire. You know how long that takes? Long time. This wasn't throwing it on the grill for 15 minutes and taking it off. No, you had to keep it there until the whole sacrifice was gone. Job did that at least 11 times a day. You're telling me that Job right, was wishy-washy on the things of God when he spent all day out there offering sacrifices up to him? I don't think so. Job was full. Full and satisfied with what God had done for him before God ever did anything for him. Because you know what Job was full on? It wasn't what God did for him, what God promised him, what God was able to do for him. Job was full on the fact that he knew who the Creator was and that the Creator knew who he was. He was delighted, overjoyed, couldn't want anything more than to know that the one who made everything came to him and told him what he expected in order to find favor with God. Which is what? The same thing that he taught Adam and Eve. The same thing that Abel went out and did, which was offer sacrifice unto God as a penance Right? As a symbol of the fact that only the shedding of blood can cause the remission of sins. 
Well, why do you think in Christ all fullness dwells? Because it's His blood that was before the foundation of the world set aside for what? To pay your sin debt. You shouldn't just be full and satisfied with your salvation. The one who bought your salvation has all fullness in Him. I don't care what you're looking for. He's got more than enough of it to satisfy you. I don't care how low you are. He's got enough to fill you up. I don't care how high you are right now. He's got enough to get you through the next valley and back up to the mountaintop. I don't care where you go. He's got the perfect directions. I don't care how it is that the world's attacking you. In Him does all fullness dwell. You're going to find great comfort underneath of His wings. I don't care what they throw at you. He's got all fullness. You know, that means His defenses don't have weaknesses. In Him does all fullness dwell. You know what that means? If the enemy comes to His gates, they can't kick Him in. But you know what He can do? The Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living. God's real good at kicking in all the devil's plans. And when he does it, you know what you'll find? You're full. God's got not just the fullness in their outcomes. God's got the fullness to keep you where you need to be so that you get to the finish. God's got enough fullness to give you faith at the beginning of the trip that whatever you encounter along the way, he's going to be more than enough for that, that song that we sang as a family, more than enough. You know why that is? Because in Him, all fullness dwells. What are you looking for today? Jesus has got all of it. You know what full means? It means that you can't take no more. You know what happens when you get to Jesus? It don't matter what you're looking for. He's going to fill you up till you can't take no more. Doesn't the Bible say, press down, shaking, and bubbling over? You know what that means? They shook the bag to get as much as they could in it. Then after they shook it, they started pressing it down to get even more into it. And then they just kept pouring until it started coming out the top. You know what that means? Full. Then even after you're full, you'll find that he starts giving you handfuls on purpose. What's that? Well, Lord, I'm already full. Take it anyway. I mean, I believe it was Charles Spurgeon that said, the psalmist, when he wrote that daily he loadeth us with benefits, that means if you really look at everything that God blesses you with, it takes about all that you can do and all you can manage just to carry around all that God's blessed you with. But imagine that you was the horse drawing the cart of what God blessed you with. I don't know about you, but my horse is real tired because that wagon's real heavy. Why? Because God doesn't just give in part. No, He gives in full. Why? Because He is full. He's all fullness. He can't help it. He's just that way. You know why He fulfills and satisfies fully? Because He's just full. I mean, imagine going to a well and no matter how much you took out of it, it don't run out. That's Him. Imagine going to a, you know, the widow woman with the cruise of oil and the meal doesn't matter how far she scraped down to the bottom they always ate until they were full every time she went to make another meal you know how much they had enough to fill them up well how long did it last as long as it needed to Elijah's sitting there underneath of the juniper tree he gets a meal from God you know how long that meal lasted 40 days why because he was full y'all don't believe me one time I ate a steak in Omaha Nebraska we was out there, so we decided we was going to do it right. I got T-bone. It was like a $75 T-bone. I didn't pay for it. I used the college's money that I was there on the debate trip for. I ate a $75 T-bone in Omaha, Nebraska, and I wasn't hungry for two days. This is me we're talking about. I get hungry walking around the house. What happened? I don't know what was in that steak, but I was full. I wasn't hungry. Hey, you want to go get something to eat? No, I'm, I'm still full. How's that possible? I don't know. But I need another one. Yeah. When you figure out that you didn't eat for two days, 75 bucks for one meal wasn't too bad. It averaged out. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? You get to Jesus, it don't make... Hey, you want any of this? The world starts off? Nope, I'm full. Sure. You want some of this doubt in your life? Nope, I'm full. Yeah. 
You know why so many Christians have an empty life? Because they've gotten away from Jesus. You stick around Jesus, you're going to be full. You, you can't avoid it. He starts just giving you handfuls. Here, hey, take some of this. You take a bite, guess what? You're full. Why? Because it came from Him. In Him does all fullness dwell. You know why some people are steadfast, shakable, unmovable? Because they're full. They're not looking to go nowhere else, not looking for anything else. They don't even want to entertain the idea of anything else because they know what makes them full. When you're full, you're not looking for snacks. You're not looking at the restaurants on the interstate exits saying, hmm, well, that sounds pretty good. When you're full, you're not thinking about anything out there. You're thinking about where you're going. Do you know why in Christ all fullness dwells? So that you don't ever have to look anywhere else. Did he not say that come unto him and he no wise cast you out? Did he not say that he'd never leave you nor forsake you? That he'd provide all your needs? How was he able to say that? Because in him does all fullness dwell. What was his one request? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Why? If you fall on him, you're going to care about the things that he cares about. You're going to love the things that he loves. What's he love? The Father. What did he come to do? The will of the Father. And why did he come to do it? So that the Father's kingdom may be full. Just like him. He's full and he's looking to fill up new heaven new earth. New Jerusalem. For what purpose? That he might have the preeminence among all things. That we'll be there as a testimony of the fact that God loved us and redeemed us in spite of ourselves. And that through it all he was more than enough to take care of me, take care of you, and take care of anybody that ever came to Him. Because in Him, those all fullness dwell. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.